Hello everybody, this is the start of a series where I'm going to build a multiplayer game and launch it so that all of us can play online with each other. Something cool. So I'm pretty excited about this. I've been getting really into building games over the past couple days. Actually, I've been interested in building games for a long time. And I've tried a couple different engines, but none of them have ever gave me the results that I wanted to because there was always such a huge learning curve. And I did try Roblox was probably the only game studio that I've used that I was able to build something that was playable and I added my own code in like I had functionality working a little bit but recently I've been using Dragon Ruby which is a library put together by some really cool people that I've been talking to recently you can learn more about it on the website I think I have to go to the actual game toolkit and then somewhere around here there's an about section but it's pretty cool the people who put this together and it's really good docs so you can look through here and learn everything that you need to know and also for deploying there's a whole different documentation for each thing so i think when i do launch my game i might launch to steam either that or if i can just do a standalone windows game and then just host it on my own website i'm fine with that too but anyways this is really cool you're able to build games like this so actually the way that you really get started is you first need to get yourself a copy of Dragon Ruby, which it does cost money, $48 for standard, and then there's also the Pro packs which include a few different features. But the standard, you can basically build most games using standard. And that's what I have. There's also income assistance, so if you don't have any money basically, you can get the income assistance mode. I think I might have to get this one because I want to run C extensions. I'm going to have to reach out to the dude. But anyways, I'm going to build a really awesome game. And I'm going to show you guys how you can do that in Ruby. I'm going to bring you along as I code on my journey. So I'll show you how I get started with my games. Right now I'm storing them in my documents folder. I have a bunch of different games here. This was my first game, which was the one I had in my last video. With the dragon where I'd run around and shoot people. So the way that the guy suggests you start your Dragon Ruby projects is actually to take the zip that you get. So you get this zip file when you download Dragon Ruby. It's somewhere in my downloads. <laughs> uh, somewhere back here. Should probably put it in somewhere that I can find it really easy. <clears throat> That's kind of the starting place for all the games. So you find the zip, you take that, and then we're going to extract it into our new folder. So I'm going to go to Documents, Dragon Ruby Games, select that folder, and then just click Extract. We can rename it after to the name of our game. So I actually take a couple seconds. I've already run it a couple times, but it still takes a while. It's kind of annoying because it has to unzip the package, but it's whatever. It's not that bad. And then once you get it going like instantly, you can see how fast it is to develop games. So it's so much better than the other options because you get an immediate feedback loop as long as you know what you're writing like you kind of know how to get started so the docs are really helpful but i'll show you guys and actually while this is downloading let's go find some assets for our games so i'm gonna look up free game assets and then the first thing we have is itch.io so that's where i was going for my assets and they actually have free options so you can download it without paying and get the whole pack of different images that you can use inside of your game. So if this will load up, we can try to find ourselves a pack. I don't know why my, my internet's going so slow right now. Okay, now it loaded. So we can try to figure out which sort of style we want. I kind of want a top down. So this one's already striking my attention as cool. It's like a forest that you can walk around. Although it seems kind of like the levels are a bit small. Which since it's going to be a multiplayer, I don't know how that's going to work. If the menus are that small. Or not the menus, but the worlds. Also check out this one. This one looks like something that we could probably fit a bunch of people inside. Cute fantasy. Obviously you can probably take the blocks and then build whatever type of map you want. But this seems pretty chill. It might even be more than I need for right now. There's so many different assets. 
is sweet. So shout out to the person who made it, of course. Let me try to download this. Just as easy as that, you can download all of the assets. Now we have this zip folder. I'm gonna have to extract that. Now we have our new assets. See what the readme says real quick. Cool. So then obviously there's all the different like, animals, tiles. So probably tiles is where you get started with, oh cool. It's really simple. So different tiles for different chunks of the map. Cliff tiles, water tiles, path tiles. Huh. Interesting. So you'd kind of have to fill those in yourself. Oh yeah, I can I can see how this uh, the tiles are coming through. Although on this you can't really tell that there's tiles at the same time. But on this they look really blocky. I don't know how this is gonna work. But I guess I'll just take all of these and I'll, I can bring these tiles inside of my app. So open the code for my app in another section. I've been actually really excited about adding my first uh, like world behind the characters because I haven't even done that yet. It's only been a blank screen so far. So first of all, let's rename our folder because right now it's just the name of that zip. I'll rename it to the name of our game. It's going to be cool. I already had one called multiplayer games, but I didn't even start on that. So I'm just going to call it cool open world game. And inside of here, this is our Dragon Ruby setup. So if we just click right here on Dragon Ruby, you can start the app and you just have to allow it. Just like this, it's a Dragon Ruby app and you can use your keyboard to move the logo around already. So this is just a demonstration of how cool, you know, Dragon Ruby is, <laughs> even though it's just the welcome screen. Anyways, to change your app, you go to my game app and then you click on the main and then you change the code inside of here. So actually, I need to say that I trust this window and then I'll be able to change the code. So right now it has all of this stuff, but I can just delete all this content real quick. So now we just have this dev tick and the arts. So that's what your basic, this is like what the outline of your whole Ruby game is just one method with args. And if you look at the documentation, everything you're going to access off the args, because this is running 60 frames per second. The tick is, is one frame. So that's how you're going to develop your game is based off frames. So it's pretty crazy. Like it's, it's some insane stuff, but I'll show you guys. So right now, if we were to start Dragon Ruby again, you'll see that I removed all the content. And if we wanted to just uh, code it, I'll show you. We actually don't even need to keep closing it because it auto reloads. That's kind of the sickest thing. Whoops. All right, so let me kind of hide some of this stuff. We'll just have the code on one side and the game on the other side. And I'll show you guys how easy it is to start adding stuff. So first of all, inside the tick, oh yeah, it always crashes when it resizes for some reason for me. I might have to figure out why that happens. It might just be a thing with the auto reloading, but what we can do is just, we'll leave it like this for now. And then inside of the tick, we can do args outputs labels, and we can shovel in I think the shorthand syntax is an array, but I've been using the longhand syntax, which is just uh, object. So you set the X, you set this to anything. And I just want it to show on the screen and then you can set the text, reload and automatically it gets added into the game. And we can change all these values and it'll get updated according, just like that. It's as easy as that. We can start coding the game. Just say, welcome to the game. And then we could even take this and we could say, now let's try to interact with like the keyboard or something. So if args inputs keyboard dot, I think it's like a long, I can't even really remember it. Key down dot 
space or something. Get something like this. You could say you clicked the space key. So, as you can see, it, it is kind of actually working, but it only stays for a second. So to make it stay, or what you do is you set the state. So args.state dot message. We could shovel in our new message. You click the space key. So anything that you set on state, like just defining a value on state, it'll remember it between the frames. So that's where you store your information. And then outside of the frame, we could just check if args.state.message, then we're gonna display it by putting it onto the outputs. So outputs labels, shovel in the args.state.message. If we reload, click the space key, it's actually not working. State message, it should be working. Oh, you know what, because I'm trying to shovel this in, I need to define the state here. That's what I meant to do. So if we click the key down, we, do, we set the state, and after that, it'll just show the message like indefinitely. So we press space and then it just stays there because anything you add in state now, since we're checking and we're just directly adding it to the page. So it's kind of easy to get confused here with how this works, but it's because the tick runs every frame that you sort of do syntax like this. So even though you're shoveling in, you're not going to, it's not going to run more than once. Like it's not going to shovel in more than once because each time the outputs resets and it reruns and like a re-renders basically with what you have inside the code. So if you do a condition and then like this state is now true, then this, this would run and we're showing the message. So that's kind of how it works. We can just remove all of this for now. We can start thinking about those tiles. So I'm going to move the tiles into our Dragon Ruby game. So look over here, Dragon Ruby, and we're going to go to my game folder, and then we're going to go to sprites. So sprites is where you usually put all your assets, although you can put it in any folder that you want. But they already have a sprites folder, so I'll just drag my tiles into there. Now we have this tiles folder. We have like these few different types of tiles. So maybe I'll just start with the grass and just render a bunch of tiles with grass. I haven't even done that yet, so that'll be kind of interesting. It's like the grass middle one. So I have to figure out how can I render one. So I can start with just rendering my first tile, doing args outputs, sprites, and then shovel in this code. And let's just start at x0, y0, type 100, width 100. And then the path is going to be sprites slash, it goes capital tiles, capital tiles slash grass underscore middle png like that we have our grass tile so that's our first tile we're only rendering one so if we were to think about how we could render in a bunch of tiles uh, yeah you kind of want to just do it programmatically so we could do 0 to 20 each do. Or since it's Ruby, you could do all of your code in Ruby. So let's say for each number, we're going to add another sprite and we're going to multiply the X and Y. So maybe we'll do 1 through 20. And then we can say N multiplied by 10. Or actually, maybe we want 0, so we start at 0. And then y n multiplied by 10. Oh, interesting. So that's how it looks right now. They're just stacked on top of each other. So that's not right. You know what? X would be by 100. The y we could just keep on the same. Yeah, so now we have 20 cubes over, which really we probably don't need that many. It's weird it didn't crash when I resized this time. Maybe once you have content in it, it doesn't crash. Okay, so we could probably just go 10 cubes and be fine. Oh no, there's still a little bit of space, so we could maybe do 15. That's probably more than enough. 
And then what I want to do is for each level, right, we'd stack up the grass. So I almost feel like you'd have, like you'd go through from Y100 through 600. So we'd have another loop here. Zero through six dot each view. So this would be layer. And then down here in the Y, we just multiply layer times 100. Ooh, and now we get a stack. That's actually seeming pretty good. If we wanted to see some space, we could actually increase it to like 125 and just make sure that we're actually getting six layers. One, two, three, four, five, six. Looks like that's right. We put it back to 100 and just add in maybe two more layers. And now we have a full green screen. Cool. <laughs> so it's very grassy here. Nothing else but grass. Just kind of weird. So we probably want to add in more stuff. See, I don't really know where these tiles come in because they look a little bit off. Kind of looks nothing like the assets that I saw on the website too. They actually already had some tile stuff in there. Hmm. All right, so to really, like this is our basic setup, right? For rendering tiles, but you can get more in detail than this. Like with code programmatically. So if we wanted to, let's say, path equals this. Or we could do like randomly, I guess. If random one. So I think that would be, or if random two equals one, then we could do a different one. So it's just like a little bit of randomness. Other way, if it's, if it is the random one, we could do the water or maybe we could do the paths. No, that, that wouldn't really make sense. <laughs> Let's do water middle. Well, I guess the water doesn't really make sense either. You just have in the random puddle. <laughs> it says something happened that they didn't like. Oh, the path. I forgot to pass it in right here. Whoa. Oh, shit. That looks crazy. <laughs> that looks so crazy. I don't know why it's going like that. Wow. I actually have no idea why it's doing that. Because it's... Oh, because we're not storing state. So it's always going to do, like, another randomness, which is... Wow. I could probably turn down the randomness a little bit. pretty exciting because like if one out of 50 chances is one there's going to be a lot less chances this is interesting what about out of a thousand out of ten thousand out of a hundred thousand now there's like barely any chance of them of it being right <laughs> it's kind of funny how that works just the chance of it being one of the crazy but I don't think that's probably how we would want to render our stuff so this is the type of stuff that you want to think about when you're doing these tests like we could have, obviously we could just start with a grassy level that's fine with me I think that would be pretty good just like this a plain grassy level and then we could render our guy on top yeah, it's probably a good start. So actually, we could move this code into a method, like render level, and just pass in the args. And we could have def render level accepts args, and we could do our code right here. So after render level, we can put in the person. So I think they give us some people from this pack. So they do have a player actually oh i hate when they split up the all of the pngs into like small little images because i just don't know how i'm supposed to load it <laughs> like i just haven't got to that part 
how to load a sprite multiple images. That's like something I almost, because I'm using this Dragon Ruby, I just need to see. Oh, maybe they actually have, if I just look up Dragon Ruby. Dragon Riders. Oh, right here, Sprite Sheet. Sick, Dragon Riders. Is that resources to help you build awesome games with Dragon Ruby? That's sick. So they did a book. They did some code samples. Interactive Showcase. Dragon OS. No way. No way of Dragon Ruby GTK. So this is this is what me and my dad were talking about building a whole game system for uh Dragon Ruby games. I think that's what this is right here, Dragon OS. Click or tap. It totally is. Yeah, it looks like this is so sick. And they do have Pong. I was literally saying that I was going to build Pong. Wait, no way. Why does it move so slow? No, that's not fair. It's like each thing just barely moves a, a pixel. That is not fair. How do I quit? There's no way to quit the game. That's... Oh, that's how I go into console? I could actually check some stuff like args.state. Dot. Set current game to nil. Let's see what happens. Hey, we we're able to get ourselves out. So that's how cool Dragon Ruby is. If you know how to code, you can actually just directly interact. Let's try this Shadows game. No way, it's a Shadow Fighter. This is exactly the idea I had. What I was thinking is to scribble my own character states. This looks great. It's like Super Smash Bros, but with scribbles. This is so unique. Alright. Let's quit out of the game. This is so cool. What is a Xeno test? It's one of these type of games. Alright. It's pretty sick. I'm gonna send this to my dad, actually, because we were just talking about this. Building something like this. We could probably take that and go put it on a console. Although, obviously, we need, we'd need we want to put our own games. And I don't think that's open source. Well, maybe it is. Let's look on the GitHub. Repositories. They did, they put Dragon OS as open source. So all you have to do to add your game, no way. <laughs> this is awesome. Are you, so I could actually add my game. Well, what I'm thinking is actually to fork this and use this for a real game console. The last contribution was two years ago too. It's crazy. Nobody's messed with this in a long time. But I'm finally, I finally figured out, I finally learned about it. Anyways, I'm going to get back to this article, which was posted earlier this year about Sprite Sheet, which is exactly what I'm trying to figure out how to do. So when making a game, it's common to have a Sprite Sheet, a single image that contains multiple sprites that you slice and display. Maybe it's a running animation. So let's assume we have this image, which is a 16 by 16 pixel image with four tiles in it. The key part of rendering just one tile as a sprite is to specify title X, title Y. Okay. So if you're, let's say, just taking like an 8 pixel section of a square, just do it like that. That's exactly what I needed right here. See, I was scared. I didn't know how I could render one of those files, but now I'm not scared anymore. And the water tile, like let's say I wanted to take out one section, which I don't understand the I don't understand the shape of this. It doesn't look like this map. I think you almost have to just take it and like take a chunk out. I don't even know. It doesn't look the same. They actually raised almost two thousand dollars. Okay, anyways, what about the player action? So that, that's even more stuff. 
we could start with this player and then try to chop out a few sections. That's actually something that I want to figure out how to do. Let's go back to our code. Go to my game sprites and let's just drop in our player. You don't need to even put in a folder. I can just stick it out here if we want to not organize it too well. Let's go back into VS Code, and we're going to try to render a character. I'll do it by... Mm, yeah, I could just copy this. But I don't know if I... <laughs> I don't know if I want all of their uh, stuff. I guess it's fine for now. But we need to go to sprite slash player.png and figure out how we can slice out the sections. So if I go to sprites player, it's 192 by 320. As you can see, it's kind of an awkward shape too. But we probably just want to figure out which one's which. Try to get it right. So we could probably start with the top left right corner. That looks like a normal kind of character. And I could see it's like maybe slightly rotating or something. There's some back running states. Can't really see the differences between these at all. They look exactly the same. Or maybe you're supposed to render down. Oh, all the ones in the line are the same, or no, they're not the same. See, there's, I don't get the order. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Uh, but let's see what happens, I guess. We come back, I don't see anything happening. We get a name right. Oh, it's Capital Player. Capital Player. Still don't see anything. Oops. Say X 400, 500. It should pop right on top. All right, what if we get rid of the tile X stuff? Okay, now we do get it. Oh, so probably the position is just wrong. Tile width, tile height. Oh, there we go. We're almost getting it. You just have to kind of adjust this. There we go. I think we got it. We got like 64. Oh, that's just the height and width. So if we went 32, 32, 32, 0. All right, that's pretty simple. So we could almost put this as like another method, I guess. Character, or I guess you know it's a good time to use some Ruby it's just to create a class. Let's create a class of player, and we can have different states. So we can inherit from self, and we can have a method like. All right. <laughs> Default, which would maybe be this one. And then to use it, just shovel in the player.default. Actually, we should set the state, because then we can change it later easily. So we can say args.state player equals player default. And then we pass in the args.state.player to render it. Cool. Sweet. So yeah, it's just as easy as that. You start with the player, and then for the different states, we can figure that out. So we can just try to like start off by just changing the states. So if args inputs dot right, so we could check for whenever I'm going right, and I could try to change it so that I can walk right. Well, first off, we could start by actually making it move. So to do that, we could change the x on the player. So we could say args dot state. Uh, player uh, x plus equals 25 so you go pick 25 pixels at a time although obviously for some reason actually it's like re-rendering so it's 
not saving this. Oh, because we're redefining it. See how we're right here, how we're setting equal on the state, which means we're redefining to the default setting. So we actually want to do or equal. Now it should work. So I can move my guy to the right, although now he's totally off the screen. So I'm probably going to want to add if args input left and then do the minus equal. I can move my guy back. There we go. So I can move him from side to side. Oh, I should probably add a boundary. So for boundary stuff, we probably just... I was doing all this complex code, but my dad kind of suggested me to put it in a method. We were talking about building the games earlier, so that's what I'm going to do right now. So I'll check inbounds. I'll make this method. And I'll pass in the args.state.player.x. And we could define this somewhere. <laughs> it's going to maybe expect x, although we're going to have y pretty soon, so we're going to want to handle both. You can just say if x uh, greater than 0 and actually we can just return the result of this x greater than 0 and x less than 1280. Basically, that's all we need to check for on both sides. Although the right one is not working. X greater than zero and X less than 1280. Greater than zero. Oh, maybe, maybe it's actually like, maybe our X is zero. So since it's not uh, greater, so we can say greater or equal. I mean, that's not how you do it. Yeah. <laughs> greater or equal. Yeah, and that works. I think I was right. Oh, but now I got it stuck. Dang it. That's pretty silly. <laughs> how did I get it stuck? So, oh, you know what we have to check is we we have to make sure that it doesn't even get to that point by checking if plus like the amount that we're going to move it to. So actually inside of here, we need to say like plus 25 and then here say minus 25 and just check if that even works first. So yeah, now it's a little bit better. Although on this side, obviously I think I did it wrong. I think I meant to say minus for this one too. Wait, shoot. Now I trapped my guy off the screen. Let me fix that. Oh yeah. I trapped my dude. Now I'm checking if it's less than 1280, but I'm already stuck off the screen. Okay, let's just reset. Relaunch the game. The weird thing is, yeah, look, it's not stopping me over there. Oh. I wonder if it's because the screen's not actually 1280. So we're checking if... If we can go any farther, we're checking if it's in bounds still after we add 25 to it, if it's less than and x less than 1280. But I'm just wondering, that's probably not 1280. So instead I can check, oh, we're not even getting the, the args in here. I can just check like a thousand maybe. Let's see what happens now. And now we can only go that far. 1200. Oh, I think I see what's happening. I have to do the negative here. I have to do the negative on both. Now I broke it over there. Actually, negative is not going to work because I had that thing to check. That's funny. It's almost like this method is not really helping. The way that I had it before was I was just checking, before it goes right, I'll just check if args.state.player.x plus 25 greater than 1280. Oh, actually less than. So, although it's still, see, like it's still, 
Weirdly, it's working. If we have to give it a little bit more space, like do like fifty. Twelve hundred. Weird. I thought it would be twelve eighty. Oh wait, the, I guess the player is a hundred pixels. Now that I think about it, so we'd have to do one hundred twenty-five. Now would be perfect. We have to count for the size of the player as well. We can always refactor this after. So now we'll just check if negative is still greater than zero. Well, I think that might give us too much space. Yeah, way too much space. So actually, I think the x calculates from the left side. We can just do it regularly. And now we have a perfect barrier on the sides. So now I just want to be able to change the state when I'm when I'm walking to the right. I want to actually see the character walking to the right. Which if we look in here, we should be able to get one walking to the right at a certain point. Probably. Um, well, this guy, actually, this is actually walking. This is literally an animation of walking to the right. You probably go down 32, 64, 128, and 130, 160. So this would be on 160. X. So we could say walking would be tile Y, 160. All right, so then on the right, we would just set args.state.player. Oh, the only thing is the X, because I want to persist the X instead of resetting. Hmm. We can probably, wait, I know what we can do. We can say player equals player dot um, walking. And then we set it first. We set player dot x equals args dot state dot player dot x. Actually, we want to set everything like the x and the y. So it has the same exact position, but we just swap out the animation, and then we're gonna say the new player is gonna be player. <laughs> cool. So it actually does kind of work, although my dude is, it's definitely not the right, right dude. I think we need one less. So instead of 160, we're going to go back to, what was that other number? 128. There we go. Now we have a dude walking to the left, or to the right. And to make him walk to the left, what we have to do is flip it horizontally. So to do that, First of all, let's say art state dot player for the right flip horizontally equals false. Because if you're walking to the right, you want it to be walking to the right. For the other one, we're actually going to be doing the same thing here. So I wonder if I should make this a method <clears throat> like to update the state of the player. I don't know. I could figure out that out in a second. But for right now, I'll just hard code it. I mean, that's really ugly because it's like the exact same code. And we're gonna set the only difference is flip horizontally is true. Yeah, just like that. And then obviously we could flip through the different states. I think actually we can do that pretty easily. So for both, maybe, maybe we'll just do for both. We can clean up this code here. Checking if right, actually if right or left, and then we'll just do an if for this. Or actually, we could just set this to input left. Yeah. 
This is pretty smart. So we'll set it. So if it's left, it'll be true. If it's right, it'll be false. Yeah, for this. So like, yeah, that makes sense to me. Oh, the only thing is the check here wouldn't be the same. Oops, I forgot. These are like slightly different checks. So we can just check if args.input.write. We're going to do the write code. Else, we'll do this code. Cool. We can say flip horizontally is true. There we go. Should be good. I don't know why it's giving me problems still. Maybe I just need to restart the game. No, still errors? Unexpected end. So somewhere around here I have an end. What's going on? <laughs> oh, if and I mean, oh. Is this actually, this is repetitive code here. Oh, we do have a, an end there. Okay. So it's working. So now we have this cleaned up into one section for both. So that's perfect. Now what I want to do is flip through the states. So to do that, I mean, it's kind of an interesting concept here. So we could say kernel, do it off the kernel tick count. You always have this kernel tick count. So what you can do is you can do code, like you can get the remainder of, di of dividing it by 60, check if that's equal to zero. And if it is, then you can run code every 60 seconds. That's an easy way you can run a piece of code every 60 seconds. So let's say if you want it every 10 seconds. Now, what if we just flip to <laughs> like a random... I wonder if you could do dot sample this for a random value, or you could probably just do it yourself with a random. But what I'm thinking is, so we have the walking state. All we have to do is set the tile X. So we could have like the different values, like zero, 32, 64, um, 96. Doing the math here, 98, 98 plus 30. 128. Oh, that is right. So we just do that for now. And then we could say for each of these numbers, let, or wait, I'm trying to do JavaScript now. <laughs> state, no, not state. Hold up. I guess image x equals just a random one. That's kind of what I was thinking here. Random. And then we could just get zero or random two three four five right but then we can minus one we get a random piece of the index see how that works although it's only gonna the problem with this is that it's only gonna run if one of these inputs is down so we actually have to move it outside and then actually we'd only run it if we have this player but we'd only want to be running if you're actually moving to the left or right. So that's another trick. But I guess for now we can just check like if arc state player and then every 10 seconds we just update the tile x equals image x. Just like that. As you can see you get the running. I guess that's not too bad. Because even if he's not moving, like he's just running in place, that's the only trick. But this honestly kind of looks like normal for a game. Where like he's just always, like he's a really active dude, you know? He likes to stay fit. So now if I want to change the, the, like, the way that his face, or the way that his head turns. So if, let's say I'm running like up, then he'll be facing away from the screen. I could obviously implement that. And there's also the attack moves. 
you probably want to implement that or like I guess it's attack directions you can attack to the right or you can attack up down okay there's even like the wind up you can see he's like getting ready to hit <clears throat> That's pretty cool. And obviously, we, did, we haven't implemented up or down functionality yet. But that's just as easy as the code right here we were checking. We have our other checks. So if args.input's top, or wait, it's not top, it's up. What am I saying? And then we'll do args.state.player y plus equals 25. And then we also need to check the bounds, of course. Just copy this code if only if the y plus 125 is less than whatever the height would is which probably is like 720 yeah that works perfectly you do the same for the down which instead of that it would be minus actually i think it's just if the y is greater than zero whoops <laughs> It's a cool thing about live reloading. Oh, whoops, wait. I accidentally still had the plus equals, so I kind of sucked my guy off the map. But that sort of code, it actually doesn't prevent you from hitting yourself back if you do get stuck off the map. But now you can see I can walk all around. This is actually pretty sick. I'm happy with this. Even without like the state for like walking up, making the dude look away, that's just kind of a bonus thing. So now I might add ways that I can hit, use a melee weapon, press space, and then this is just the start to our online multiplayer game, guys. Pretty soon you're going to be here with your characters running around saying what's up to me. This is just the start to our experience. Sweet. I was just working on the game a little bit more off camera with my dad because he wanted to check out the game. And then he had some improvements that he had in mind, so we kind of just coded that. So I'll run you through real quick what we changed. So first of all, there's the default state, which it will switch back to. And as you can see, it's not moving, like it's not animating, because we noticed it was animating even when it was standing still, because of the way the code was written. But now it only animates when you're actually moving. And then when you're done moving, it goes back to standing still. Another thing is if you move upwards, it actually shows like the characters turning around. So I've added that in using the sprite. So if you remember, we have the player sprite. All I did is I just moved from the section, like you can, in Dragon Ruby, you can set the tile that you're using. You can basically extract a certain section of the PNG. I'll show you the code right here. So inside the code, I think I did some refactoring and just kind of cleaned things up, made it work a little bit better. Another thing is I added in the switch image function because uh, as you saw before, I kind of had some code where after I would switch the player, I also had to update the X and the Y. So I figured I would just build it right in so I could easily switch the player state just by setting it like this using switch image, which takes in the method. So it could be any of these available states and then it just switches out the X and the Y. And it uses the other uh, fields that are set. So the important ones are really just tile width and tile, or not tile width, <laughs> but the important ones are tile x and tile y. So that's where it, that's how it determines which square it's going to use. So we start off with just the 0, 0, so that's the first square. And then from there, we have the different states like walking and facing away, which correspond to the different lines. So the one for walking is right here. One for facing away is this line. We have different states that it's going to run through automatically. And the next thing I was going to add in was the attack feature so that you could press any button and then it would make the character do one of these animations. And of course, when it is attacking, if there's any characters nearby, it would cause damage. So we'd add that in. Although obviously, right now there's no characters. It's just an empty map. And I guess my dude is moving kind of fast. My dad was saying that. Like he's just speeding. You can't even really track it because it's moving so fast. Probably slow it down. 
I could definitely slow it down by changing really this number right here, this 25 is the number. So I might want to just set that to like a velocity. I wonder if you can use constants because I love using constants. Maybe we can do velocity at the top, set it to 25, freeze. I don't know if they have any of this. Wait, it almost seems like it works. Yes. So I can set it to 10. It should be going a lot slower now. Yeah, it is going slower. But one thing that's weird is actually the animation isn't smooth now that it's slow, I can tell. Like, what really should be happening is when you move, it should play the animation smoothly as you walk instead of, like, it looks like it's just resetting. And I know exactly why. Because inside of each function here, wait, where do we do it? Not here, up here on the left or right we switch it to walking but what we actually need to do is we need to let it play because every frame it's just gonna go back to the default position i didn't realize this oh that's tricky so i mean the best way to really to how would we deal with this we need to only set this if it's not already this state <laughs> so it's like how would we check how would we check if it is in the right state for walking i don't know i'm also kind of tired i might just get back to this but that's cool that i did discover a new bug because i can fix that and it'll be a lot smoother after i fix that animation I'm not gonna stress it right now. I've already been coding a lot today. So I was doing some research into actually what I can use for the multiplayer functionality. And I already had the idea that I could probably use WebSocket to broadcast the positions of the other players to each other and then update the map. And there's actually a Dragon Ruby socket extension that some people put together which actually runs WebSockets and they have a whole documentation. So if we look at the docs right here, you can see the setup and it's super chill with Ruby. You just connect it to the server and then you can listen for specific event types, which is exactly how you would do it in a JavaScript setup. So that's pretty cool. Now I did get it set up, but it turns out to use custom C extensions, which is needed for this socket extension to work you need to have the indie plan on dragon ruby which i do not have currently so if you look at the game toolkit you try to download it there's a few different options but it's fine because uh actually you can gain access to this for free so i didn't even read this down here if you go down to free unrestricted indie license you can get a free lifetime indie subscription as long as you do, you basically do some of these goals at the bottom. So contribute pull requests to Dragon Ruby's open source repository, be active in the Game Jams channel and help facilitate Game Jams on itch.io. I didn't even see that that was a thing, but Game Jams are a thing where they do challenges. So I'll show that off. If you go to the Dragon Ruby Discord, it's free to join. And you can look at the Game Jams a channel somewhere around here. There is a lot of channels. There's a voice channel for Game Jams, but I'm pretty sure there was a whole channel. I don't know why it's so hard to find now. Game Jams right at the top. So what I saw is there's actually one that starts in a few hours, a game jam from the 13th to the 7th, hosted by Polyducks. And honestly, it looks like not that many people are active. I mean, there's a little bit of some people. But what we have to do is we have to help do these game jams. And submissions are due in four days. So what we have to do is make a Game Boy inspired game. The jam lasts 10 days, includes two weekends. It's kind of interesting. You have to have a Game Boy theme, it has to be all pixelated. You have to keep the original Game Boy screen resolution. 
and then use the same number of controls as the Game Boy, D-pad, A, B, select start. These can be represented by any keyboard keys you like. And then the palette, color palettes must consist of a maximum of four colors. Which is pretty easy, although you can't use AI. <laughs> That's funny that they do this whole animation. Like, no AI. But it's sick how they do the pixel art and then they just animate it. I never realized how much I like stuff like this. Quirkiness. Game Boy Soul graphics. Look, everything is pixelated. So you almost have to... I think another thing is you have to do it all by hand. All assets must be created. Except fonts. That sounds so hard. I don't know if I can do this because I'm still trying to work on my first game. Like my first kind of bigger game. You can also complete a coding challenge in the Hellkite channel. Sheesh, where's the Hellkite channel? Hellkite, down here, open spaces. <clears throat> I don't get what the challenge is. The shader beta. That sounds sick. Alright, I don't even know if I'm ready for that. Gain a rank of black belt, 10th degree by helping newcomers, posting game dev work, and shipping games built with Dragon Ruby. There you have it. So all I gotta do is just launch my first game and share it out in the show and tell. It's probably what I can start with. And then we could try contributing to open source. Let me at least start it so I can figure out what's going on in this. Okay. Yeah, so look, he's super chill with the money though. So if you don't make more than a thousand, or are a student, or are a big time Raspberry Pi enthusiast, you can just contact the dude and Explain your situation and he'll set you up with Dragon Ruby. So guys, don't worry if you think like, whoa, like $40 sounds like a lot of money for a dev cool kit. It's not because think about how these corporate companies are charging people crazy memberships. Adobe charges you $50 a month, which is like $600 a year, which is more than six times more than Dragon Ruby, even on the most expensive plan. Your directory structure should look like the following. Cool. So it looks like this is the source code right here. Wait, game toolkit contrib. Yeah, look at all this. Wow. I'm looking at the real code. So here's args. I've been using args all the time. They give it an accessor for all of these different things that we would usually mess with. Initialize it here. Wow. We have a setter method for the tick count. So here's actually all of the methods that you could do to which is kind of scary because that means you can override the tick count if you wanted to. Which I guess that's not too big of a deal. What's so bad about overriding the tick count? <laughs> we have an audio hash which keeps track of the volume that's pretty important but I'm pretty sure they called it gained inside of on the API and we have all these different things that we might use I'm looking for outputs there's output stocks inside of runtime few more things cool so that's it it's hard to believe that that's all the code so where does it actually where does it take it and compile it to see 
here's the string class. Because I was reading online that Dragon Ruby uses its own like fork of the Ruby language that supports most of the things. So that's why they have their own class defined, because they're overriding it to make it work better when it compiles down to C. There's probably like a few things that they do here that makes it better than just the standard Ruby methods. So even stuff just like formatting the text and putting it down to the bytes. And we also have the keyboard. So I've been doing keyboard a little bit and we have all these different keys. all of them right defined right here there's a lot of Elias methods too wow and they actually have all of these keys to find out too like all of the different random characters pretty sweet but anyways for now it looks like I'm gonna have to release my first game and just you know make YouTube videos do all of that stuff so that they can trust me a little bit more and then after that we can get access to custom C extensions and I'll be able to add in Dr. Socket and I'll start making videos about making multiplayer games using Ruby launching those on the App Store because honestly I love making games it's just so much fun bringing all the assets in yeah it's pretty sick I was just messing around a little bit more with the game and I ended up creating this path, which I kind of like the look of it. It's because it is a little bit different than just having the green background. It kind of feels like there's something you can walk on. Still, like you're not able to go past the screen, so probably would want to like load up new areas as you walk further down the path. And then maybe on the green part is just like, could be people that you can meet and like adventures and stuff. But the way that I did this is inside of this check, I basically do a condition for the path and I check if it's layer two, then I'm going to use the path middle, which allows me to have this path going in the middle of the green. I think it looks pretty good. So now I'm gonna try to spawn in some more items. I'll probably just use whatever I have for the asset pack that I downloaded yesterday. But I might even add more. So there's outdoor decoration. Yeah, we're probably going to go in this like chess and outdoor decor. <laughs> looks interesting. We try to put in some logs and some mushrooms and stuff. That looks cool. So to add that in, I'm just going to grab that, put it in my sprites folder. Now I have this outdoor decor. Call it outdoor.png. And then to grab a specific part of the sprite, you do it just like we're doing it here. And I could try to render. Let's just do it at the end. After we render all the blocks, I could start rendering like side items. And I could find it in a way to clean this up. But this is actually pretty good render level. This is like one instance of a level. So I'm going to render the sprites slash outdoor. And I'll just try to figure out how I can make this look right. Whoops, almost went in the browser. Should be showing up. Not seeing it. Or. Oh wait, I'm never adding it to the level, that's funny. Do args output dot sprite. Shovel it in. Oh, now we get a bunch of different items, so that looks cool. Let me reduce the width on this. Still maybe a bit too large, so we can try 16 pixels. Maybe 24.
looks like the image is 112 by 192, 192 height, 112 width. So if we try to do the math on that, 112 divided by 32, you just have to figure out whatever is like equal, I guess. I think I've figured this out now. I was able to render out a specific thing, like a little piece of grass. So I was thinking I could save this into a method. Grass. We could define it at the bottom. It doesn't have to be inside of that class. Like a little piece of grass, and then we could change it up with the X. So like a larger piece of grass, and I could just take that and go like 10 dot times. Do right, I should probably do this outside. <laughs> Something like this. Except for I want to be able to change the X accordingly. Like I don't want to use this, so let's pass in. Y. Or actually, just say like this, set grass to something, and then define the new X. So X, let's say I wanted to put grass. Just like that, we have a little bit of grass, although it kind of looks weird. But it's cool, we can add in more. This is just one layer of grass, we could probably do another one. Now we just have to change the y, negative 128. Then we could change up this logic. Or depending on how we want to layer up the grass. I kind of want to do like opposite, you know what I mean? I wonder how I could do that. I could start it off. 128 plus or actually 64 probably yeah we got it kind of offset we can actually put this in a loop 0 4 2 So it is <clears throat> expecting end somewhere around here. I forgot to end. It is kind of tricky. I have so much. Oh, yeah, I think right here with the each. Let's see what's happening. It doesn't really seem to be working how I want. I still need to do some more logic with the height. So actually, if most of this is the same, we could probably just define it once. Hmm. Yeah, we could pass in the X on the outside. Either going to be this or it's going to be this. Basically just if this, so we can get rid of the condition. Just do this one time, but do the check, set the X. Or we could just default it to this one. And if this, we're gonna reset it. Uh, undefined method n 
Oops. Supposed to be... Oh yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> I was supposed to multiply the x by the n that's down here. So actually, let's leave this. We'll just add a base modifier. Say base modifier plus, and then we can set base modifier to zero, but in this case, we'll set it to 64. We can offset. Although the y is still not changing, so we need to basically do the same thing minus y modifier. And actually, the y modifier is going to be determined by the layer. So like layer multiplied by 64. And there you go. We got grass. We can increase the amount of grass easily. Sick. There's obviously more uh, different things that we can use from the outdoor section. One was the carrot sign. There's also flowers. It'd be cool to have some flowers. So maybe some of these, instead of grass, it'll be flowers. Actually, I know how to do like rareness, basically, for spawning flowers. And it's as simple as just checking if random. I was doing this earlier. Oh, actually, that's gonna make a trip out though. That's the only problem. Because if you do random, it's because it reloads every frame, it'll make it go crazy. So it doesn't really work, but if you said like random a thousand out of a thousand numbers, if it's equal to one, then you change it to something else. The G could be grass in the else case. Although the tile X is still gonna get set, so we need to only do that in the else case. Everything else is fine, we just need to set G to flower which is another one that we can define actually we can just take the funny thing we can just take grass we can actually now that I think about it we can just change this tile X to do a different one actually we just need to change tile Y so okay for and then we say G tile Y equals 32 You'll see it starts like tripping because it's going to be randomly spawning rocks for like every frame. <laughs> so what you have to actually do is you'd have to store this into state somehow like this whole you want to render this level one time and store it into state. Which I don't even know you'd have to go through like each thing before you render the sprite. That's the interesting thing when you start working with like the state because if you really wanted your your random rock to stay in one location for the whole map you'd store that as state that way whenever the frames reload it's not like redoing the random thing which is kind of silly so the way that we can improve this i guess would be instead of doing it each we could do a map which would return an array and then we would return basically an array of different arrays and we could set this like base level is equal to this mapping of arrays and we could render the sprites actually we just return the sprite value and then we could render the sprite after the outside by like looping over the base level array saying I have a bad value for range can you not I wonder if you can't map over a range that's a thing wait now it's working wait it's not really working but I think we got the base level which should be a mapping which means an array of arrays. So now I would loop over. Okay, I would set this state. So argstate.baseLevel 
is going to be or equal to this. And what we could do is take that base level and just loop through layers and layer. It's also another array, so each item. And do args dot outputs dot sprites shovel in the item. So that works for actually the funny thing is I did that for the base level, which already was working fine because I didn't have any randomness. What I actually needed to do that for was for this uh like I guess the decorations I could call them. It's the same process. I'm just gonna convert this to map. I'll put parentheses around this just in case. Instead of adding the sprites down here, we would wait until after this loop. We'd set this whole thing into state. So args.state.level decorations. Make sure you do or equals, so it doesn't redefine. And then to add them to the page, you just shovel in. We have to do the same loop actually. Arcstate dot level decorations each do level and level dot each do item and we can display the item just like that. Oh, actually I don't see it working probably because we're not returning the right thing in the map. So we're supposed to return an array of items, but I think to do that, the last thing we need to return is the G. And because we're already saving it in state, it's going to be using the wrong code. So I just need to set it back to equal and then put back the or equal and the state should save. So as you can see, it's saved. The thing is, there's no rocks that spawn this time. So we could actually come in here. We could turn down the randomness to one in a hundred. And Again, just remove the oracles for a second, put it back. Oh, we didn't catch it at the right time. There we go. Just like that, we got two rocks on this map and a bunch of grass. It's like kind of randomly generated terrain, I guess you'd call it. Although at the most minimum level, it's just decorations. And I'm just going to close the game for a second so you can see if I relaunch we'll get new state, so it should spawn the rocks in different locations. Or even, this time we didn't get rocks, let me try again. This time we got one rock, so that's pretty cool. And maybe we can add something where like you can go and kind of like mine the rock. You click a button and maybe you can get like cool stuff from the rock, that'd be fun. They're kind of rare, and then we can add in mushrooms too, with the same, like this same kind of logic. You just have to come in here to see we're checking if random equals one. You check for something like two. <laughs> random level. It's, I think you can't do case statements in this. I'm gonna try it one more time because I really want to. When one, when two. And then we'd have to have a default state, so else. Cool. I think that cleaned it up a good bit. Now, obviously, we, it's not going to work because we're doing the or equal. We have to remove that and see if it still works. Or actually, just launch the game. It's probably like relaunch the game, see if it works. Not seeing any rocks. Okay, there we go, we get one rock. Pretty cool. So, it looks like it's actually working then with this case statement. Then if I wanna do a mushroom, that would be for if it's two out of, like the number two. So it's, it's the same rareness as the, like the, the rock, I guess. I'm gonna use a different image. Let's grab maybe a flower. I think I want to do a flower. That's actually what I wanted to do originally was a flower. Let's try to get that flower. So instead of 32, I think it would be 16 maybe. 
I don't even know. Yeah, we got it. We got flowers. So I kind of want the flowers to be more common than the rocks. So to do that, I'm just going to add in... I guess... You can do a different type of case statement. So if you do case without passing in an item, you can actually check like when random level equals 1. And what I'll do for this one is when random level in like 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, which means it's going to be a lot more common. And let me go and restart the game. It actually broke because it says there's no method in. Oh, that's from... I can't remember if that's from Rails only for, or from Ruby, but apparently it's not supported here. Another option is just to check the array. So let's do it backwards. Put the numbers in array and ask, does it include the random level? And that does work. Cool. Let's go ahead and restart the game. See if there's, yeah, look, there's so many flowers now. Because we turned up the rarity level. I guess decreased rarity, increased the common. Cool. It's actually pretty cool. And on top of here, we could try to render more stuff, like have some larger rocks. We even have gold, gold reserves. So I guess you could probably, you know, harvest some gold. That'd be cool. <clears throat> we could actually use this to show it in the inventory. You see how you have like the gold blocks and the iron blocks. So maybe after you mine the rocks, you can collect those in your inventory and then turn it into blocks. That's pretty cool. See what else they have in this pack though. I remember they had a few other items that I might find useful. This fantasy, they had enemies. So let me take a look at that. They have slime. <laughs> I don't know if I want to do slime. And they also have skeleton. Like the full setup for skeleton. If we want to add in some enemies. I also need to add in the attack for the player. Or the, the actions down here at the bottom. Right now, you don't really have any attacking state, no matter what button you click. So I'd love to add in like one of these actions, just make it play through when you click the attack button. So to do that, I'd probably just go down here on the player, and add in a new state. This is how I've been organizing it, although the code really is just repetitive. Basically, just defining the same thing over and over again. The only difference is tile X and tile Y. It probably would be just a better idea to swap these out instead. I might try to refactor. Let me see. How far down is this? So I've been doing it in increments of 64. I think, or maybe 32 each. So 32, 64. 128. Maybe not. I'm about to do the math on this. Let's try like 32 times 6. That's 192. You can try that out. See if that works for attacking. 192. Now it'd be like the first swing, and then you swing. Okay. And we would do attacking when the player clicks the space bar, I guess. You set up the control here. If args dot inputs dot keyboard. I forget how to do this. I think it should just be like if keyboard space. So we can actually do the notify. I don't know if I'm doing that in here. Uh, on the dragon ruby docs there's a really cool notify function you can use to kind of debug things while you're coding and while you're gaming if i drop this in say base key with clicked and be able to tell if that function is working okay it is working this is just as simple as checking this space key was clicked if it was then we're going to say the player is going to be attacking. So the thing I was doing yesterday, I was using this no input count to actually 
set the user state back to an idling state so he's not like jittering and it's not gonna because this is the animation actually right here uh, yeah weird thing though for us I don't think we even have this is one two three four five states if you go back in here the ones at the top have up to six but the ones for the attack only have four so I'm gonna have to have a little bit of logic for that animation wise but we're gonna need logic anyways because I need to stop it after it's done because it's gonna infinitely loop I think or actually wait it's not even going through an order we're just doing random doing like a random animation which isn't really how we'd probably want to do it we'd probably want to just go in order but we can figure that out So what we're going to try to do is just switch this to the attacking. You know what, just see what happens. <laughs> oh yeah. You know what, it actually works pretty well. Although obviously some sometimes your dude disappears and like glitches. <laughs> also, because it's random, like, you know, the animation is just random, which it's almost not a bad thing. Because it usually is right for when he disappears. So to fix this, because the attacking only has up to four options, we just would need to remove the last one unless the state is just walking. <laughs> That's where it gets kind of tricky. I almost just need to store a state on the player. <laughs> we could basically do that if, let's say, up at the top we say args.state. Layer like, action. We could start with just idling. Or we could even define it into like an array. 0, 1, 2, 3 or something. We just want to write it out so we can actually understand what each action means. Like put a comment. Idling. Moving. Attacking. Something like this, so we could at least see which what each state means. Um, or maybe actually we comment out this whole thing. These are just the potential options. Just want to document them at the top with a little bit of you know comments in Ruby so it starts off at zero and then what could happen is if the player is moving which happens in these different states which say equals one right here is when after the user has stopped moving then we put it back to a zero so it's idling again for space, actually, we can just do it is packing, which would be two. And then inside of here, for this array, define it dynamically. So let's say array equals if player action equal to two would be attacking. So attacking, we're just going to delete one of these off. Else, we can do the original. Actually, I think there's one more state on the other one, so we might even want to include that. So if I add 32 to 128, it equals 160. Cool. Now we get an additional animation in there. Well, like I said, there's still that glitch with moving. 
I had saw yesterday. I mean, this kind of works, but still, like, the randomness just makes it weird. Like, it doesn't feel like it's automatic. Because it's not animating right. So I want to actually fix this. Instead of just doing random one of them, I want to go through, like, one at a time. So, let's say, like, animation. Arcs.state. Dot. Layer animation count. Okay, if not argues of state the player animation count, we could set it to zero. Else we can do plus equal one. Right? But if actually we have to check if this plus one is greater than the amount of items. So let's actually do this below this definition of array, because then we can say if it's greater than array dot size. Wait, if it's less than. Oh wait, I got the indentations messed up. So basically, wait, if the player animation count plus one is less than the array size, Otherwise, we reset it to zero. So what that means is that it will incrementally go through each animation. At least that's what it should do. Yeah, it totally works now. Wait, does it, except for, it kind of, I think it, yeah, the animations are better. Although, I think because we're doing timing based, sometimes you're going to do hits like more than once, which is probably not expected. So we'd almost want to go through and instead of just looping back, like right here, we'd loop back. For some states, we wouldn't want to do that. So actually, it's all based on the input count. We're doing like 50. I might put this into a constant. No input counts. Find this up at the top. Even if, okay, we set it to 50. But what I'm saying is, how about after, in the else state, this is after it's played through the animation, we can just check again if args.state player action equal to no input count, or actually wait, args.state no input count equals this constant, which means it would automatically stop playing the animation. Let's check it out. Nah, it's, it's not working. <laughs> now when I play, yeah, it's not liking this. So this is if, if plus one's less than array size, else we're doing a check where we basically turn it off. I wonder if the state is just frozen. Let's try to restart the game. Click swing. No, it still, still doesn't work. So I want to debug this player animation count. Let me grab that notify code. Hmm. Yeah, I think I see what's happening though. It's going too fast. So the animation count is not working because we have to figure out how many frames we want each animation to play for. And with one, it's just way too little. It doesn't give it enough time.
that's what I'm realizing. So the animation count, just doing it, trying to explicitly do this is not going to work. We need to use another increment. So let's say we do it by five, or wait. Would we do that? We would count it, we would check it here. So index, we could say index equals arc state player animation count divided by five. But then I just need to check is it a if it's a full integer. Oh wait, I could just say index to i. So it should just get like the closest match. Let's see. Interesting. <laughs> it adds like a little bit of an awkward thing to the app. Hmm. We're trying to figure out when do we switch the state and also when is it done? Right here, if it's greater than the array size, I actually need to multiply array size times five. Get that to be more accurate. Okay. Doesn't really work though. Now the animation count is just doesn't seem right. Right, like this needs to be five. This needs to be times five. Let me just restart the game. <laughs> Fresh state. It's like. Still kind of right. No, that shouldn't be five. Hold up. It should be one so that goes slow. But then you check if it's the array size times five. And uh, down here, if it finally is, then you it would either loop it or we would just turn off the animation. Like it almost works, but then it doesn't really. That notification isn't really helping because it's saying for 10 seconds. We switch it to just one second, 60 frames. Yeah, the animation count is 26. Which is interesting. I think we might never be resetting this. So I think in both cases, we want to set this to zero. We only want to reset the input count, which would stop the animation if it was the attacking. Okay. Doesn't really seem to be working though. Index could be ring size times five divided by five. Almost feel like that's right. But that's the same thing that we already had. Index would be based off of the player animation count. I guess, yeah, what I would check is if their animation count is 
equally divisible by 5. This. So actually, that would be the case that we would add all the stuff. Else, we're just not going to do anything, I guess. And the index would just be the divisor of this. Like, maybe not. Let's try to restart the state. Still tricky. I guess you don't have to actually divide it. What am I saying? We'll just blow. I guess you do have to divide it. This just returns the remainder. Say animation index. Print out whatever index we're on. Well, it's happening every five frames. So we wouldn't even really get to see the alert in time. Maybe we'll use 10 instead of 5. Error. I think it's actually working better. Also, I, I guess it's because I turned down the frame rate for the walking. For the hitting, it's still way too slow. I need to change it to like a 3 or something. Maybe 2. Just doesn't work right for some reason. So we do one. Maybe one was the right amount of the time. That seems right. The only thing is there's like a slight glitch at the end. Because it looks like maybe when it resets to, to zero, it actually runs like the first one again. Just somehow, and then like a little glitch. Even though we we're supposed to turn off right here when we said no input count, that was supposed to like kill the animation. But I think it's because we're saying if it's less than. <clears throat> I actually don't know why that would be happening. Because we're setting it to no input count, which should be. But then in this one, we're actually checking if it's greater than. I was thinking though, this would stop the animation completely. But as you can see, you do get this notification on the last one, which means it did run. 
Like somehow it glitched and it still kind of ran. It's not. But actually, maybe we should just. Well, I guess that would just be the first time. That's why we don't want to run this. Okay. Let's say if. Uh, player animation count greater than zero. We run this code. Yo, that's <laughs> it doesn't work anymore just with that. Put it back. This one almost seems like good. But still, the walking, it should be a smooth animation instead of like resetting. That's still something that I was having, to, that I wanted to tackle and figure out. So to do that, when you're going, when you're walking, which is basically just left or right, <laughs> we need to not redefine it if the player is walking. So we've already done it. So if args.state.playerAction is one. Oh, I almost now I wanna implement like a third one for like moving uh horizontally. Moving vertically. I almost want to move the attacking, but I can't move it because I, I mean, I could move it to, like, where are we checking that? Player action equals two. We're only doing it in, like, a couple places. So we could change it to three. And actually, we might as well just change it into a constant attack action, yeah. Moving horizontally. Actually, I'm about to just define these all as constants too. You know, like action equals one. <clears throat> Moving vertically equals two. Moving horizontally equals three. And then attacking. Let me make sure I spell this right. Attack action equals four. Cool. This is actually a way better way to do it because then if we ever need to change something, it's a lot easier. Now we just have to set where we're setting all these actions. Like for this, obviously, now we're going to do what well, we could do moving vertically. And what we can do first is check if argus.state.player action not equals moving vertically. We're gonna run this one time, and then we'd set the state. The other cases, player action, instead of one, we need to change wherever we define this and just set it to idling action. Ooh. Moving vertically. We should probably handle this um, up. We set it to idling action. Or no, we set it. Wait, what? Oh, the, wait, I did this wrong. It should have started at zero. One, two, three. There we go. Cause yeah, it wouldn't be idling action. This was, this was supposed to be moving. But instead, it's going to be moving vertically. So it would be one still. All right, that looks good. Ah, oh, but turning, turning isn't working. Player action not equal moving vertically. <clears throat> vertically, I think I got it mixed up. Horizontally is left right. Vertical is like up. So I need to switch this to moving horizontally. 
There we go. And I'm pretty sure now the walking animation might be better because it's not lagging, but it's still the player moves really fast. You can't even really tell. So we can reduce the velocity to five. Oh, you know what? That's actually kind of better. We still need to work on like I guess the walking states for going down because that just looks kind of funny. Oh, you know what? I think what's happening is the same bug we were having for walking is now you can walk and the animation just plays. And it's like super chill. But the up, it's still doing the glitch. That's why it has like the frame kind of stutter that's annoying. And it's the same logic that we added here where we have to check first before we just override. That's what we need to do. And basically both of these up and down. So we need to check for this. Except for add a not equal. Moving her horizontally. Then we're going to do this. Yep. Actually, like, once you do kind of add in these constants and stuff, the code gets cleaner. You can see how you can, like, reuse it. So now, oh, the only thing is when you're walking up, it doesn't turn. That's interesting. <laughs> right, because if you were, now it doesn't know the difference between, like, walking up and down. So facing away has to be another state now. So instead of moving hor instead of moving vertically, we would change that to moving down. Just to attacking. I guess we don't even need the comments because we literally have it written out. That's the cool thing about constants too. So moving down is one, moving horizontally is two. Let me actually update these. Moving down is going to be two. Oh, wait. Moving up. Yeah, so moving up is the one where it's going to be facing away. So then on the up one, and check if it's not moving up, then we're going to set it to moving up. The same for moving down. And there we go. We have working animations for walking. Although, the funny thing is, like, it doesn't really look like he's walking. It looks like he's just, like, shaking his hands. But I guess that's cool. I don't see his feet moving. It just looks like he's hovering. But, like, when he's walking this way, it looks right. So I might just need to look at the image and make sure that I'm rendering. Yeah, I don't think I was even rendering the right UI for, for example, walking is going to be different than idling for sure. So if we look at this, it looks like walking is on the fourth level or walking forward is on the fourth level. Walking backwards is on the sixth level. So all I have to do is add in those different states, which should be pretty easy. Um, let me just go back in the code. So facing away, I guess for down, instead of setting it to the default, we would use a new one, which would be um, just call it walking down, <laughs> or like walking forward. We can even call this walking away to make it a little bit more simplified. Okay, now let's go down here to the player class where we have this defined to be walking away. And this one, like I said, it was on the wrong tile. See, so we're using tile 64. If you go back to the player image, that would be, I think, the third row. So what we need to do is we need to drop it down like three more rows to use the correct walking away animation. Three more rows would be three times uh, tw uh, 32. So it'd be, I think, 96 plus this. So if you add 6, that'd be 70 plus 90, it's 70 plus 90, is 160. Let's check it out. Yeah, now we get the right state for walking away. <laughs> we don't have one for walking forward. 
That's why we got that bug. I'm going to add the walking forward state. And this one is going to be, like I said, on the fourth row. So we just remove 64 from the state for walking, which would bring us back to 98, which would get us the walking forward effect. Looks sweet. You can walk forward, you can walk to the left, right? We have pretty nice looking animations. I'm really happy with this. Maybe the next thing I'll add in is just like looting resources, decorations, and like characters, enemies, all that stuff. But this was cool for the game design, like the, the level. Because one cool thing you can do now is right here on rendered level, this could just be one level, but you could actually abstract this into a way that you can modify levels that are similar, but like you add more stuff on top. So we might keep the base level, but then all the decorations could be different per like the different rooms that you walk into. Oh, this is looking really good already.